Welcome to PR After Hours, your twice weekly cocktail of business, PR, and marketing tips hosted by me, Alex Greenwood. Every week, we bring you virtual happy hours featuring business advice from entrepreneurs and leading thinkers in PR, marketing, and business. We're going to get started in just a moment, so stick with us. This is Julie Cortez, freelance rock star, coming at you. You are listening to PR After Hours. Okay, we've all gotten used to the remote worker thing. But you know what? I was a remote worker before COVID. I've actually worked with remote teams for, oh gosh, at least eight years now. But I'll tell you something. It's challenging because you've got to find the right people and you've got to find the right affordable people and you've got to find the people who are self-directed and can help you grow your business. Well, I've been there and I've tell you what, I've mostly been frustrated. So that's why I'm very excited to speak with Chris Martinez today. He's the founder of Dude. That's right, Dude, which gives digital agencies the people and processes so they can take on more projects and scale profitably. There was my problem. Where were you back in the day, Chris? We're going to talk about that. Chris owned a digital agency for three years, and then in 2015, he moved all of his web design and development to Tijuana, Mexico, and it was a total game changer for his agency. And he can tell us a lot more about that. It was a big game changer. I want to hear more about it. So let's welcome Chris Martinez to the Virtual Lounge PR After Hours. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Alex. So you cracked the code. Yeah, I mean, we did crack the code on a, a few things. Uh, we definitely had our fair share of uh, stumbling points along the way, but that, that was one of the biggest turning points for my agency. You know, because when I started my business, I had actually had a failed business. Um, in 2007, my dad died of cancer, and oh. then I decided I wanted to start my first business. So I started a print soccer magazine. And I lost everything, like more oh. than everything. I lost close to like 200,000 bucks. Ouch. Um, so, you know, I had to get back on my feet. And then I started learning about web design and development. Um, I learned how to build my first website by watching online videos. So I bought a theme, built my first website, WordPress website over the course of a weekend. I didn't know anything about design or development. So it was totally self-taught. And then I started learning about marketing. And I actually hired Russell Brunson's company at the time um, called Dotcom Secrets. They had a coaching program. They taught you about traffic. And back then, it was all like affiliate traffic stuff. Right. And so I started learning about the marketing side. And then 2012, I got a job working for a, a digital marketing company doing sales. <coughs> Sorry, I'm choking. Um, and they, did, they didn't do websites. And so you know, we were driving lots of PPC traffic. That we were horrible websites, horrible landing pages. So I said, what if I started an agency still paying off my debts, mind you, you know, so I still had a lot of, you know, pay, pay, payments that I couldn't make from that old business and basically got sued and da da da, da. Uh, all that fun stuff. So started this agency and we had a little team in the Philippines. I think we started out with like two people and then that started to grow and still, you know, working at my day job during the day. So my schedule when I got started is I would work from 6 a.m. to well, I would go to the gym at 6 a.m., get home, work from 7 to 8, and then go to my day job from 8 to 5-ish, come home, and then stay up to 1 o'clock in the morning and work on the agency. That was my schedule for two years. Oh, holy cow. Yeah. Actually, after the first year, I started doing the agency full time, uh, but I still kept that 6 a.m. to 1 a.m. schedule. I was young, you know, younger. Um, I didn't have a family. I didn't have anything else really going on, and I was flat broke, so all I could do was work. Um, and so, you know, basically grew that agency. We had about 50, 60 clients and then fast forward. Now it's around 2015. We still have the team in the Philippines. It gotten up to about nine people, I believe. Uh, but the time zone was just killing me. Like I couldn't do that 1 AM anymore. And there's just all these inefficiencies with communication because we're not communicating in real time. So then by this time I'm living in San Diego, California, and I'm like, I bet you I can find a team down in Mexico. And most people don't even think that Mexico is an option for design and development. Uh, And so, and I don't speak very good Spanish. So I like took the leap of faith, went across the border, um, ended up hiring some folks, made some bad hires at the beginning. Mainly Mm. it's just because the culture is very different. And I didn't understand that. There's no handbook on how to open up a web design development company in Mexico, by the way, until I wrote it. I wrote that book actually. (laughs) Um, So then uh, eventually we figured it out and it was just game changer. And we went to over 220 clients on retainer. 
And uh, I was managing everything with anywhere between like five to seven people down in Mexico. Um, and then 2017, do you want me to go into the dude story? Cause it kind of segue. Uh, let's do it. Okay. So 2017, we have like 220 clients, you know, and I'd always dreamed of having hundreds of clients and, uh, but it, it just wasn't, I, I didn't really like it. Like I didn't like the, the business that we had built that much. It wasn't like, I wasn't passionate about it anymore. And, uh, but I was really passionate about trying to evangelize this amazing team that I discovered down in Mexico. Cause I would tell other agency people like you have to try to get talent down in Mexico. It's an untapped resource. And so I would tell all these, everybody, every agency person that I could met, that I could meet, I would tell them. And none of them could set up a company down there. It is actually very challenging to set up a business in Mexico. Um, lots of different laws. The, the structure of setting up the company is a lot different. Even like setting up a bank account is very, very challenging in Mexico if you're not a Mexican citizen, which I am not. Um, and we f figured out a, a hack, like a workaround. Um, and so 2017, I'm like, you know what? What if I helped other agencies to get access to this talent pool? Because we had already had very good systems internally. Like that's, that's one thing that I think that is something that I'm very good at is just processes and systems. Um, and so we had already good internal processes that we knew that we could carry over if we were to switch to like an outsourcing model. So we set up, dude, we started running Facebook ads and that's how we got our first customers and kind of proved the concept. And then in 2018, uh, we signed up for the Traffic and Conversion Conference in San Diego, took the leap of faith, spent like 10 grand uh, on the on the booth and the all the swag wow. and all that stuff. I mean, at the time, mind you, dude itself was only doing like 12,000 in, in monthly recurring revenue. So that was a big chunk to wow. invest. But I just knew that it was going to work. Right. Um, and so we got the booth and we, uh, went all out on Mexico. So we were like, I dressed up, I created this Lucha Libre Mexican wrestler <laughs> costume. I don't know if you saw it on the website. I did see it. <laughs> so like, that's just kind of who I am, but like I'm in spandex and a wrestling mask in front of 6,000 people at this booth trying to promote our company. And we're passing out Mexican candy to everybody that came by and just having a good time with it. And, and it worked, right? And so that was kind of like the springboard for the rest of the year. We ended up going from five to 29 staff just that year in about nine months, grew the company. And then uh, the year after that, we doubled. Um, and then last year, um, we grew again. And then now we have over 90, 90 staff. Um, and we won the Stevie Award for 2021 for uh, Minority Owned Business of the Year. So we were first place for that. And then we got a second place award for most innovative company under 100 employees. Um, and the, the most, the proudest that I am about that is that we finally got the opportunity to show showcase our staff, our people, you know, because these are all the folks that are behind the scenes that are doing the work for the agencies, helping the agencies grow, helping their SMB clients to uh, get more leads and, you know, build their online business. Um, and finally, I got the chance to tell our story on a bigger stage where all these other folks from around the country and uh, around the world really were able to kind of hear about us. So that was really, really exciting. So that brings us up to today. <laughs> God, that's a, that's a hell of a story. And I, there's funny, I, I've got a couple things in common with you real briefly is that I've been in business 11 years, uh, same business, but, uh, I took a, I took a detour down some, uh, 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 inbound marketing, let's just say, and, uh, yeah, ended up, yeah, losing my, you know what, um, and it's still working on that. But, uh, uh, the other thing, though, is I've been known, and there are videos of me doing PR tips uh, from Batman. So we both nice. have something in common here. I like that. You're not afraid to be a little goofy, are you? Well, you know, I like to say that we're the band of misfit toys. And, like, everybody who works <laughs> at the company, you know, we're all a bunch of weirdos. And that's – actually, we, we did our kickoff call, our quarterly kickoff call just the other day. And um, th there, that's a common theme with all of our staff. Because to work for us, um, especially if you come from a Latin American company – or a country, you need to have a different mindset. You need to have this belief that it doesn't have to be the way that it is at every other Latin American company. And that's why when people come work for us, they just feel like they're at home and we give them a, an environment where they can thrive. And finally, just like be like, it's like, a, you know, the, the weight is lifted off their shoulders. and like, yes, like I can finally do the work that I know that I was born to do. Chris, would you say, okay, I've done some uh, outsourcing with India. Um, 
nearly did Philippines, but I, I got to say the time differential, I just mm-hmm. felt, I felt very out of touch with my team and I did, and I'm, and of course I am too old now to even think about staying up all night to, to deal with that. But I wanted to ask you, so you'd mentioned though, that there were some cultural hurdles you did have to kind of uh, jump to, to work with Tijuana. Um, yeah. Would you care to share that? Is there, is oh, it absolutely. A, yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's some very simple ones. Um, and then there's some ones that are definitely like you wouldn't know unless you were down here. So I'll, I'll give you two examples. So the first one is that when you're hiring people in Mexico, they negotiate their salary net and they negotiate weekly. So to put that into perspective, if you hire somebody at your company or you go to get a job and they say, we're going to pay you $50,000 a year, right? Depending on where you live, there's different income taxes, but there's income taxes nonetheless. So you know that after taxes, I'm going to take home this much money, right? At the end of the month or like twice a year, you're going to get, or twice a month, you're going to get this payment and this payment, right? In your head, you kind of understand that concept. In Mexico, the employers pay the taxes on behalf of the employees. So what the employees say is, I want to make, you know, uh, they'll say, I want to make, you know, $500 a week, right? The employer then has the responsibility of calculating an additional 30 to 40% on top of that, of which goes to the employee's insurance benefits, health insurance, because they have nationalized health care down here. Social Security, there's taxes, there's an insane amount of taxes down here in Mexico. Um, and, and so what the employee sees is just the net amount, and they have no idea how much is actually going to the government on their behalf. Wow. Now, personally, I think that's by design because the Mexican government doesn't want people to hold them accountable for anything, ah. which is in, in a different perspective. Like I now understand that us seeing our taxes as American citizens is a huge benefit. Because Mm. now we can call out every employee or every government when they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? That gives us a source of power. By being in the dark like that, you're just kind of like, oh, well, whatever. I'll just take whatever I can get because like Mexicans love to say that Mexico is a poor country. Mexico is not a poor country. Really? It is not a poor country. It is a country that pays a shitload of taxes. Everybody pays a shitload of taxes. And because of government corruption or just corruption in general, um, that money doesn't find its way to the people. But the people have no idea. So, of course, we try and educate our staff on that um, because we want to make those societal changes down here as well. But, yeah. So, anyways, getting back to my point is uh, that's one aspect. So, when I started hiring my first people, right. uh, you know, I would calculate their salaries. And then I was like, well, yeah, that we agreed. We're going to pay them. Like, what I quoted them is gross, not net. And then I had some very unhappy employees at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was one instance. Now, another thing that ha- – did you have a question by, about, about no. that? No. No, I, I was, I was not. I will just add though that since you asked me, uh, that I was totally unprepared for that. Never heard of that ever. Never, and that I would have walked in just like you and went, "Oh crap!" Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Ahead. Yeah, but go ahead. So what it else? was an honest mistake. But uh, let me actually. There's another layer to that too. There's a very adversarial culture between employee and owner in Mexico, and and Ooh. and this is true across any country that has a lot of government corru- corruption. Is that you know, the, the people who are taking orders always think that the people that are giving the orders are taking advantage of them. It's something that's passed along generationally. Okay? I see. Yeah. So when I did that, now the staff are like, here we go again. Another person just trying to take advantage of me, just like my dad said was going to happen. Right. Just like all my friends said was going to happen. So that really tainted the relationship with my first staff. I take 100 percent responsibility for it. I should have done my homework, but. You know, you live and you learn. Um, And now, obviously, we don't make those mistakes anymore. The second challenge that I learned just a couple years ago. So we had a a, a monthly kickoff meeting and uh, the food was running really, really late. And so, you know, we're doing the meeting and um, we were getting really behind schedule and I was waiting for the food. So the food shows up and I give the food to everybody and I say, we're going to do a working lunch Right. Very common in the United States. Oh, boy. Here we go. A lot of people like a lot of people will go like I used to go to the gym on my lunch hour and then I would eat at my desk. Right. It's very, very common in the United States. Not in Mexico. The lunch hour is like a sacred time. You do not interrupt the lunch hour with work. Right. And so I said, we're going to have a working lunch. I'm going to go through the meeting. Well, that was interpreted by the staff as 
he's trying to pull a fast one over us while we eat. He's trying to like, you know, slide some things in that we're that are going to screw us over in the end. Right. And this is like years after I had started the company, too. So there's wow. still that underlying distrust that you always have to overcome going into another country. Um, and so I learned that after the fact. And then, of course, I made a grand apology and, and I never made that mistake again. <laughs> but, you know, I can understand from their perspective, like. I think that the nuclear family in Mexican culture is much more valued than it is in, in, in American culture. Um, and I think there's a lot of value to that. Like, I'm not one to say, like, you know, your family shouldn't be important. Um, right. It's very foreign to me because I didn't have a very good relationship with my family growing up. So I don't understand the American side. I don't really understand the, the Mexican side either. Um, but I, I see a ton of value in it from the Mexican cultural perspective as well. And so it's just a small change. And in the end, like if I had just ordered food from a different place or I had managed the schedule better, I wouldn't have had that problem in the first place. But again, you live and you learn. And now we don't make that mistake again. Right. Right. Now, has there been um, just just on a, on a technical on a skills level and on a professional level, how how perhaps folks in Tijuana approach the work as opposed to people north of the border? Um. Okay, so I'm probably going to piss some people off here, um, but if you've ever hired people in the States, uh, there is a general consensus of entitlement, I believe, when it comes to the American workforce. Mm -hmm. And as, a, as a, an agency, um, it is very frustrating when you go and hire a developer, for example, who has this attitude that you need me more than I need you. Or right. I'm just taking this job until I find the next big job at Amazon or Google, right? Right. It's unbelievably frustrating to have to deal with that. Because as an owner, like, this is our baby. We put our life, our blood, sweat, and tears into this business. And everybody that we want to bring into our company, we want them to have the same passion about our business. And unfortunately, it's really hard to find those types of those, those folks, especially in the technology environment, especially now that other agencies, bigger agencies are paying really, really large salaries because everybody's getting their stuff online. So that is one of the biggest challenges with hiring people in the States, in my experience. The difference between Mexico is that if, an, if a Mexican citizen goes to work for an American company, no matter what the size of the company is, that business is seen as the dream job. So Alex, how would you like to have somebody that comes to work for you that thinks that your job is the dream job? And they bring an attitude of, I will do whatever I need to do to help Alex's company survive because I am such an, I'm such an, I've been such a great employment opportunity right here. I have such a, I have such a great op employment opportunity in front of me. Wouldn't yeah. that make your life a lot easier as the owner? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what you're saying is that they will actually virtually show up and they will not give me attitude about everything. Right. <laughs> that would be really nice, really refreshing. Right. So that's one of the biggest advantages is the attitude. Now, obviously, like Mexico, same time zone as the U.S., um, that's another huge key component because I don't know why, but for some reason, when Americans look to outsource, we look and let's pretend like we're looking at a map. We look mm -hmm. to the left or we yeah. look to the right. We never look up and down True. To, to find people in those time zones, right? True. So that since you have people that are in your time zone, you're able to communicate in real time, which is unbelievably important. It helps things go way more efficiently and you'll be way more profitable. Um, and you're also able to find people that are going to be happy to work with you because they're not having to pull a graveyard. Right. Yeah. So if you hire somebody from India or the Philippines, which there's still amazing people there, we still have um, a handful of folks over in those countries. Um, but we require them to work our time zone. So they're pulling an all like a graveyard shift for yeah. us. Right? right. And they believe in the company. So they like doing it. Um, but in the Philippines, for example, it's impossible to find people that are going to work a graveyard because for them and their culture, family is way more important than work. They're not going to sacrifice being able to spend time with their kids in the evening to work at a job. They'll work the graveyard. They'll take a lower salary, but they're not going to jeopardize time with the kids. Um, and so that's why, like, the time zone thing can be really challenging also when hiring great talent. The, the, the thing that we've been able to identify that really has been a game changer for us on the hiring side is we have a very extensive hiring process. It's like seven steps where we are able to identify people that have great technical skills, yeah, but more importantly, they're amazing human beings. 
Oh, and nice. as I was mentioning earlier, is like we find the, the band of misfit toys. Um, and these are all people who have this internal need to serve and help other people. That's very, very challenging to find, especially with design and developers, designers and developers. And we have a whole screening process that we do. Um, we're able to find these people. It includes, of course, like technical tests, it includes um, personality tests, values tests, I, uh, intelligence tests. Um, it's very, very intense. But at the end, we have an amazing team um, and they integrate with the company very, very quickly and they get up and running very, very fast as well. And then, of course, they serve our clients. So that's something that we've been able to do internally um, that has been a, an absolute blessing to our company and to our clients. Can I ask you, I, I know we're running low on time here, so I want to ask yeah, no you just a couple, couple of quick more questions here. Um, and, Chris, and I want to step back here, and, I, and you may have covered this, but how – how how is it going now? Uh, that you're established there in Tijuana mm -hmm. and all that. How is the Mexican government, the, the the local states? How are they treating you? How is that to do business for you? Well, we still fly very low under the radar, <laughs> for one. But I mean, we pay all of our taxes. I pay millions of pesos a year in taxes down here. Um, we have staff all across the country now. Um, we also have staff in South America, like which I think I mentioned. Um, you know. The thing is, is like, just play by the rules. Like, unfortunately, there's a lot of people here, even businesses trying to take advantage of the government and government trying to take advantage of, the, of businesses. Just keep your head down and play by the rules. Like, hmm. you gotta, everybody's gotta pay taxes. It sucks, right? But we can yeah. still make it work, right? So we just do what we have to do and that's it. We have no problems whatsoever, knock on wood. So the, I guess the last question, I think that a lot of people, particularly um, some of the folks who have their own agencies you're listening into PR after hours, uh, what might want to know is, um, and, and I don't, I know it's probably a, an indelicate question, but is, is there a pay differential there? I mean, you don't have to say exactly how much, but is there, is there a, a real kind of a, a bonus of getting great people and not necessarily paying American rates or, or how do you feel about that? I am all for like, this is one of the most amazing times in history to find people. Right, because you have access to people all across the world, and I like to say that you can find whoever you need at whatever price you can afford. Right, nice. whether that be hiring people in the states if that's the best option, whether that be hiring people in Asia because the rates are a little bit cheaper, whether that be hiring people in Latin America or Mexico, wherever that is, you can you can go to Eastern Europe or Central Europe because there's lots of talented folks in Poland, Hungary, like those right. areas, Czech Republic, amazingly talented people. They're nine hours ahead, which can also be challenging. But wherever you, whatever person you need, you can find those folks anywhere. So when we're talking about a pay differential, now keep in mind that I came from the Philippines to Mexico, which on paper, Mexico is about twice as expensive, if not more than the Philippines. However, when I analyzed what was going on with my Philippine staff, they were literally having to do everything twice. So I'm paying them double. So what's the cost difference, right? When I moved to Mexico, when we consider that we're getting things done right the first time, right, it ends up being pretty much negligible. And then the, the way that I look at staff and that I would encourage everybody to look at staff is that there's got to be a return on investment on every team member that you bring in. Yeah. So if that team member costs me, let's just say $15 an hour, right? When all is said and done with taxes and blah, blah, blah. When, if that person cost me $15 an hour, but they help me generate an extra $150 an hour in revenue, mm -hmm. who freaking cares, right? <laughs> exactly. That's a exactly. great multiple. If you get a 10x multiple on a team member, that's fantastic in my book. Your margins are good. Your cost of goods, which is typically for us, it's labor and some software, but your cost of goods should never exceed 30% of your revenue. So if you're doing 10,000 bucks a month, that means that your budget for uh, design development, whatever for that, uh, for those projects should be $3,000 or less. So as long as you can build a team, which I know that you can do for $3,000 or less and still do an excess of 10,000, maybe up to $30,000 a month in revenue with that, that budget, you're solid, right? Yeah. If you ain't making money, then there's some other problems, which there's five other areas that you could potentially be losing money. But, um, yeah, I mean, like, what does it matter? So, you know, cost perspective, it is uh, about double, if not a little bit more than the Philippines. But for me, what I've seen and for what our clients enjoy, the communication makes it yeah. way more efficient. 
So you can, you know, make a lot more money uh, by having that team that you can communicate with in real time. Chris, you know, you talk a good game and you obviously walk it like you talk it. You help digital agencies by giving them the people, processes, and education so they can take on more projects and scale profitably. I'll say it again. Where were you about five years ago when I was trying to do this? But you know what? If I ever decide I'm going to try that part of it again, I'm, you're my first phone call. Hey, Chris, if somebody wants to get a hold of you to learn more, how, where do they go and how do they get there? Uh, best place is just go to our website. You can go to dudeagency.io and uh, we have a lot of content on there. I also have a podcast, which I got to get you on, Alex. Hey. Um, <laughs> what's the name? Of, what's the name of that show? Uh, Operation Agency Freedom. So if you go on our website in the footer, there's a little. Actually, if you go to the about page, there's also a bunch of the episodes too. Um, so even if you're, you know, not in a position to work with us, um, we do work. Typically, our clients are in the half a million up range in terms of revenue. So they're not starting out really. We do, we do have some offers for smaller agencies, but typically they're in that half a million. Even if you're not in a position to work with us right now, there's tons of great content where you can learn and eventually build up your agency. So you get to a point when you need to start scaling your labor um, because your sales and marketing are, are cranking, then uh, you know we can talk. So. Well, it sounds fantastic. There'll be links in the show notes, folks. And if you have trouble finding them because some podcast aggregator stripped them out, it's easy to go to PRAfterHours.com and check out not only this wonderful episode, but tons more in the virtual lounge. Chris Martinez, thanks again. The Dude Agency, my gosh, dude, you do abide, don't you? Yes, the dude abides. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Couldn't get out of there without me saying it. All Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Hey listeners, are you considering new ways to build awareness for yourself, your clients, your brand, your business? Might I suggest the podcast option? The podcast option is actually my new ebook available exclusively on amazon.com. In this fast reading book, I give you the benefit of my 15 years of podcasting and broadcasting experience with stories, practical tips, and advice from hundreds of hours I've spent as a podcast host, producer, and guest. The podcast option is mandatory reading for those new to podcasting and a welcome addition to the Veteran Podcasters Library. You can get the podcast option, tips and tricks to make podcasting work for you exclusively on Amazon.com, or you can click on the link in the show notes or visit PRAfterHours.com. The podcast option, I hope you will choose it. Oh, you know what that means? Looks like it's last call here at your virtual lounge for PR news views and interviews. Don't forget, you can ask me a question anytime. You can do it through our Twitter account, which is at ours PR. Or even better, you can send me a message vocally. I would love to hear your voice and I'll answer it on the show. There's a link in the show notes. All you have to do is sign up through Anchor FM. It's free, doesn't take long and you record your message, I get the message, I will play your audio, just give me your first name in the city you live in, and then I will answer the question to the best of my ability right here on the show. Don't forget to, if you're enjoying this podcast, you can support it and help increase the frequency and value of the show. Just consider being a sponsor for your brand or your agency or just yourself because you're like, I like this show. Or just drop a few coins in the virtual tip jar. Either way, there's links in the show notes. Please check that out. All of that, of course, being in the show notes where you're listening right now or at PRAfterHours.com. I see that they're turning up the lights. Last call is over, and I've got to clean up this virtual lounge. And Until next time, I'm Alex Greenwood, and you've been listening to PR After Hours on Anchor FM. <laughs>